Food and eating is crucial for survival. And it was always one of the most important part of human and divine life. It is probably explained in the best way in one of the Sumerian proverbs, food is the matter, water is the matter. However, it looks like it was not a bare necessity for all creatures in the world of God. Although it is the only case known from textual sources, the existence of the Gallu demons in the netherworld is worth noting, as according to the fragment of Inanna's descent to the netherworld, their lack of expectation in this matter are exceptional. Those who accompanied her, those who accompanied Inanna, know no food, know no drink, eat no floor offering and drink no libation. They crush no bitter garlic, they eat no fish, they eat no leeks. They it was who accompanied Inanna. And the same motive is used again in the Dumuz dream, where the fearsome creatures were described again in the following words. Those who come for the king are motley crew, who know not food, who know not drink, who eat no sprinkled floor, who drink no port water, who accept no pleasant gifts, who do not enjoy a wife's embraces, who never kiss dear little children, who never chew sharp tasting garlic, who eat no fish, and who eat no leeks. But for most divine and human beings, food became more than a simple nourishment. It changed into the form of cultural aspect of life and leisure. It could even be described as the means for reaching happy and rich life, free from any worries or fears. Dishes and feasts were natural companions of joyful men, so it should not be surprising that feasts seemed to play a very important role in the life of gods as it was depicted by literary text. Therefore, some elaborated descriptions of the divine feasts could be expected, however, lack of detailed portrayals should be noticed here. Obviously, the cuisine was not only dependent on the epoch or year season. As many other factors in human societies, it soon turned into a criterion of social division. Poor people ate differently than the rich ones, and lower social classes could not taste most of the aristocratic relishes. According to one of Sumerian proverbs, the poor man is the one who does not have gazi when he has meat, nor does he have meat when he has gazi. And gazi was a very piquant spice, very expensive, used to season, as a seasoning for meat. The same rule, at least in early period, was in compliance with the description of gods and goddesses. As supernatural beings, they could not eat the same food as human beings. It can be easily concluded from the fragment of debate between sheep and grain. At that time, at the place of the gods' formation in their own home, on the holy mound, they created sheep and grain. Having gathered them in the divine banqueting chamber, the Anuna gods of the holy mound partook of the bounty of sheep and grain, but were not sated. The Anuna gods of the holy mound partook of the sweet milk of their holy sheepfold, but were not sated. For their own well-being in the holy sheepfold, they gave them to mankind as sustenance. It would seem that gods were able to consume, but unable to eat to their fill with cereal or ovine products. On the basis, a crucial difference between human race and divine beings can be easily described. Moreover, in three of textual fragments cited above, about sheep and grain, and as well as about galut demons, this difference is such a fundamental one that no man can ever think of being equal to God or demon. Nevertheless, if gods could not eat cereal or ovine products, what did the divine diet consist of? If we took the literary chronology, their cuisine developed in time as the human society did. Before the creation of humankind, they could be vegetarians, as a fragment of Ninurta and the turtle reads as follows. You, my plant eater Enki, who shall I send to you? Not of minor importance uh, is here a fact that Enki was a friend of mankind and creator of the most important and basic agricultural tool, the hoe. This can be reason for depicting him as the one who does not eat meat nor dairy products. From the other hand, uh, such an expression could be connected with the myth Enki and Ninhursang, where the following passages can be found. Enki said to his minister Isimut, I have not determined the destiny of these plants. 
what is this one, what is that one. And then his minister describes to him different plants and Enki is eating this plant. And after such feast, Enki determined the destiny of the plants, had them know it in their hearts. Whether or not Enki was a vegetarian indeed, fruits and vegetables were highly appreciated in divine society, especially by goddesses. A young goddess, Uttu, demands such garden products from Enki, who was crazy about having an intercourse with her. The creator god fulfills the expectations of Uttu, what is described in the myth Enki and Ninin Hursang as follows. Enki made his face attractive and took a staff in his hand. Enki came to a hut of Uttus, knocked at her house, demanding, open up, open up. She asked, who are you? He answered, I'm a gardener. Let me give you cucumbers, apples, and grapes for your consent. Joyfully, Uttu opened the house. Obviously, divine cuisine was not a tasteless one, as we know from the textual sources that at least one seasoning was used during heavenly feasts. It was salt. Although it is not mentioned in Sumerian myths or religious texts, in much later texts of Maklu ritual, this ingredient is described as follows. You are the salt that stands in a pure place. Enlil made you as a dish for the great gods. Without you, there is no mealtime in Ekur. Worth noting is the expression, a dish for the great gods. What could suggest that only major gods and goddesses used salt as seasoning. If this assumption was correct, the use of salt could be another premise for the differentiation of social strata. Whatever was the shape of divine menu, drinks were not the lesser part of it. On the contrary, one could have an impression that drinks were the basic part of divine cuisine, whilst food served as nothing more than an addition to the drink. Goddesses and gods loved to drink different alcoholic beverages. In Enki's journey to Nibru, two of them are mentioned. The text reads as follows. He directed his steps on his own to Nibru and entered the temple terrace, the shrine of Nibru. Enki reached for the beer, he reached for the liqueur. He had liqueur poured into big bronze containers and had emmer weed beer pressed out. In kukuru containers which make the beer good, he mixed beer mash. By adding date syrup to the taste, he made it strong. Obviously, gods were deeply interested not only in drinking, but also in preparation of different beverages. According to the text is seated above, Enki knew the process of brewing a strong emmerweed beer. However, the liquor was mentioned as made ready for him. This fragment can suggest that he was not interested or maybe not skilled in the process in which liquor was produced. Nevertheless, divine society was eager to drink such already prepared beverages as the same text in another part reads as follows. In the shrine of Nibru, Enki provided a meal for Enlil, his father. He seated An at the head of the table and seated Enlil next to An. He seated Nindor in the place of honor and seated the Anuna gods at the adjacent places. All of them were drinking and enjoying beer and liquor. They filled the bronze aga vessels to the brim and started a competition, drinking from the bronze vessels of Urash. They made the Tilinda vessels shine like holy barges. After beer and liquor had been libated and enjoyed, and after, and text is damaged, from the house, Enlil was made happy in Nibru. Interestingly, a meal prepared by Enki for Enlil is described with just one word, a meal, whilst the ancient editor of this text paid much attention to the divine drinking party. Such parties must have been very popular among ancient inhabitants of Lower Mesopotamia, as there are plenty of mythological texts in which heavy drinking was mentioned. The aftermaths of the consumption of huge amounts of alcoholic drinks were also very well known to goddesses and gods. It could be positive, as for Enlil, who was made happy in Nibru, but also negative. Drunken gods could lose the control over their decisions, as it was in the case of Enki whose irresponsible donation of the mayorals to his daughter Inanna was preceded by the following circumstances. Enki welcomed Holy Inanna at the Holy Table, at the Table of Anna. So it came about that Enki and Inanna were drinking beer together in the Abzu and enjoying the taste of sweet wine. The bronze aga vessels were filled to the brim and the two of them started a competition drinking from the bronze vessels of Urash. 
such donation is not the only one example of unwanted effects of alcohol consumption. Such a divine recklessness could be sometimes dangerous to the human race, as goddesses and gods, being creators of the world, might play with their creative powers. Sumerian myth Enki and Ninmach contains an explanation of the existence of cripples and other sick people in the world. The whole calamity of a divine wager is consequence of which the created disabled people started with a drinking competition. As Enki and Ninmach drank beer, their hearts became elated. Apart from dishes and drinks, goddesses and gods were eager to eat deserts, first and foremost, cakes. The sweet and smooth taste of a butcher cake could disarm and calm even such a fire's goddess as Inanna. Her father Enki was aware of it, so he ordered to prepare cakes, cold water and beer to properly welcome Inanna to his house. The text reads as follows. When the maiden had entered the Abzu and the Riduk, when Inanna had entered the Abzu and the Riduk, she got butter to the cake to eat. They poured cool refreshing water for her and they gave her beer to drink in front of the lion's gate. He made her feel as if she was in her girlfriend's house and make her taxes damaged as a colleague. But Inanna was not as devoted to the sweet cakes as another member of the divine family, moon god Suen. When he came to Nibru, Enlil offered him his beloved delicacies, among which cakes, beer and bread can be listed. The text reads as follows. Enlil rejoiced over Suen and spoke kindly. Give sweet cakes to my little fellow who eats sweet cakes. Give sweet cakes to my nana who loves eating sweet cakes. Bring out from Ekur the bread allotment and first quality bread for him. Pour out for him the finest beer. Order pure sweet cake, syrup, crescent cake and clear water for him. Presumably these cakes, as fancied by gods, contain butter, flour, honey and various fruits. There are some recipes for special offering cakes, Ninda Idea or Giri Lam as well as for cakes made only for palace in Sumerian sources. Such cakes can be similar or identical with the described in aforementioned text. So as we can see, we have the flour, butter, white cheese, dates, Smyrna raisins, or in Ninda Idea, flour, butter, white cheese, dates, grape juice, apples and figs. We have also special offering cake Gidi Lam. Usually it was an offering pastry only for gods, but sometimes for the king. And ingredients were flour, honey, dates, and sometimes also figs. Although rarely, in the divine menu also meat dishes were included. According to mythological texts, if gods and goddesses ate such repast, they preferred roasted meat rather than cooked or fried. It also seems that kids were concerned especially tasty. Such course, roasted kid, is mentioned in the description of the feast organized by heaven's inhabitants after the creation of human beings. Roasted kid must have been a festive dish, as in following text it is prepared by the greatest gods themselves. The text reads as follows. Enki brought joy to their heart. He set a feast for his mother Namma and for Ninmach. All the princely birth goddesses ate delicate reed and bread, Anne Endil and Lord Nudimut roasted holy kids. Interestingly, it seems that goddesses preferred much lighter cuisine than gods. The first choice was delicate reed and bread, whilst the latter's heavy meat dish. Another thing that should be noticed here is the fact that gods are meat, uh, ate meat no earlier than after creation of men, their slaves and food producers. This also can be a clue in the matter of food habits in sedentary societies. Only in stratified society, the highest class could afford to include meat in their diet. With all probability, the opinion about a divine taste has not been changed through centuries. Offering lists from the later periods do not seem to be severely altered. In one of Amburbi rituals performed against the calamity coming from unfavorable divination, following ingredients can be found. 12 emmer breads, dates, Sasku flour, mirsu, syrup, butter, and beer. Such an offering seems to be typical for magical rituals, as it is repeated many times in other texts. Sometimes the list is more detailed, containing various kinds of bread, beer, or flour, as is the case of Namburbi against calamity caused by the field or garden. 
seven panigu breads, seven ear breads, seven bowl breads, long bread, kukuru pastry, mirso syrup, and butter. Now, this kind of offering is enlarged in little in Namburbi against the misfortune caused by not rightly followed cultic rules. On the offering table should be placed. You put two rations of emmer bread, you place their dates and good floor, you put their mirsu with syrup and butter, you libate mihu beer, you will kill a kid, shoulder means the bone, fat and roasted meat, you will place the if we would believe every readable data from textual sources, it should be admitted that God sometimes consumed also a special kind of meat, human flesh. As far as I know, there is only one such case included into an incantation from McClure ritual, the victim of witchcraft and black magic manipulation is addressing his or her pleading to Gibil, God of Fire, in following words. Devour my enemies, eat who is evil to me. As a recapitulation, I would like to present a model of the evolution of food habits in the society of gods, with some references to the development of human societies. In the first stage, the most important was just food and water necessary for survival. The basis of cuisine were different plants. After the development of sedentary life, various garden products emerged, like fruits and vegetables, sometimes seasoned with salt, so probably other seasonings also emerged. And then societies learned to process plants into more complicated products as bread, beer, decor, wine or cakes. In the end of this way, after having more workers and better rising of everyday life conditions, meat also entered the menu of gods and men. Thank you very much for attention.